Welcome to the Weekly Mag. On today's show, the Catalan film director Albert Serra will present his latest film, Pacifiction. We'll also be discovering the work of Anna Bruhl, a Catalan mezzo-soprano who lives and performs in Austria. Juan Sordet will also be presenting his latest album, Far, and much more on the Weekly Mag, your TV show in English, hosted by Marcella Tupor. Welcome to the Weekly Mag. We are happy to present our episode number 150, which we celebrate, as always, with lots of uh, contents for you to have fun, uh, practice your English, and learn a thing or two along the way. And our first guest is an award-winning and well-known film director from Banyolas, who has already been on our show. He is back with a new film, Pacifiction, Albert Serra. Welcome back to the Weekly Mag. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to have you back. Yes, <laughs> I've been here, I think, three times or two, two or this three is, times. This is the third time, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But not here on this set is the, is the first time. Yeah, it's brand new. <laughs> you like it? Yes. Okay, so, well, well congratulations uh, for your film, uh, Pacifiction. It was uh, very successful at uh, Cannes. Are you happy? Yes. With uh, uh, everything? Yes, yes. I think it was the most original film of the competition and people was really, you know, expecting something different and at the end I think that they got it. Yes. Uh, did you expect uh, to, to win uh, the Great Award? No, because uh, we knew from the beginning that it will be, this kind of film will be difficult for the kind of jury. We had these years so of distributors that know better than me all these things. They said it's very, very difficult to win a prize and it's not their cup of tea, you know. And, uh, right. well, we were very quiet. We knew that the film will be very well received because artistically, you know, it was a good achievement, I think. And, but then prices are different, you know, and the rules of winning or prices or not are different. Actually, it was very well uh, received by uh, critics. It got uh, really good reviews and uh, you were received with a great ovation. Uh, yeah. from the audience, so uh, I was sure that you were going to win La Palme d'Or. Well, yes, <laughs> you, you were sure, but I was sure that I will not, so I was happy with that. Well, maybe next time. Yeah, maybe next time. <laughs> it's always good to have, you know, a new motivation for the next film. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk about the film itself, uh, Pacifiction. Um, where did you get the, this idea uh, about the film? It's uh, set in Tahiti, by the way, yes. in, a, in a magnificent, with magnificent uh, landscapes, uh, great uh, cast. And what is it about? Let's talk a little bit about uh, the plot for those who haven't uh, seen it uh, yet. It's the story of a French uh, government representative uh, based in uh, Tahiti. It's a story which um, also uh, involves uh, nuclear energy and political corruption. Uh, what is it really about? It's about of na the world of nowadays. You know, I wanted to. I don't know, we have some, some all, we all live in a world where we have some intuition, some, I don't know, some, we feel some tensions, you know, rich people, it's every time richer, poor people, it's more poor. So, I don't know, there is something a little bit higher than in, in the organization of the world, and uh, this can go until the paranoia, you know, because this is, a, as you said, a French uh, government representative, and he has to deal with his superiors, but also has to deal with, okay, with the population, the local population of that place. So here start to appear a lot of tensions because in, in this middle point, he is really lonely. And uh, I don't know, he, he, he tries to discover what will happen with this nuclear test. And, you know, this is a little bit, and we share the perspective, you know, of being really in unknown territory of not knowing who rules the wall, even inside his own government and, you know, it's all this, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. How did uh, the shooting of the film uh, go? Uh, Tahiti, uh, which is uh, magnificent, like uh, I said uh, before. How did it go? Um, your relationship with the cast. I know that you have a very special way of, uh, of working with, yes. with the cast. I think uh, it, it go very well for us because it, there was lockdown when we were there. Part of the shooting, there was total okay. lockdown. We were allowed to shoot. 
but there was nobody in the places. So I wanted from the beginning an artificial touch, you know, the, 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 all the decors, all the places should have this uh, uh, artificial, uh, artificial look. Um, and this was better for us because it creates, it's, it's almost a ghost city, okay. what it, it matched with the paranoia of the main character. And, uh, and it puts out all the possible, you know, social element of the plot because there is nobody. You never see a real island. You never see, you know, it's always like a dream mm -hmm. island. And for me, this was very useful and I was happy with it. And also from practical uh, point of view, it was also better because there is nobody bothering you where you go. And uh, in, this case, in this sense, it was uh, very good. Also, you know, I was lucky because I found very good casting there, very good actors from the island. And, uh, and if you see the film, you know, they are magnificent. We have a very professional and very famous French actor. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I think it, uh, Benoit Magimel? Yes, Benoit Magimel. It's very well known in France, not so much here. Uh, but they match very, very well with the local actors, also because, you know, for the plot was necessary. And it's also this colonialist tension again, or the, the kind of, you know, colonialist tension of nowadays, if it still exists. So, I was very, very happy to, I don't know, because we always go to a place and we don't know anything about the place. We just arrive, all the crew, and we have a shock with this reality, but at the same time, for my way of shooting, three cameras, very long shots, and very, I don't know, easy going thing. Uh, really, the, 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 there is a communication between the reality of the place and the people and the film, and somehow, the, there is elements of the, of the atmosphere of the place that can, go directly to the images, inside mm -hmm. the images. There is always uh, also Sergi Lopez. Yes. Uh, he is part uh, of the cast. Why did you think of him to I take part in I don't know. I was looking for from, you know, actor from here. And he was, I knew him before, so I, maybe he was the one that I prefer. And also, I knew him. I mean, I knew he was a good guy and as a person, as a human being, so. Uh, this film um, has also uh, quite a lot of humor compared to your previous uh, yeah. works and narrative plot. Yeah. Why it's is a, that? Well, it's a dark humor. It's not that because I like to mix different layers in the atmosphere of the film. So because the, here you have humor, but it's a little bit dark humor. It's not very on the on the edge. Uh, of being not politically correct because of the, all the colonialist thing. But then, okay, okay, there is also another layer that it's the paranoia of the main character, that it's almost abstract, this layer. Then there is uh, other layers of, you know, visionary or maybe insightful uh, political uh, comments, no, or observations about uh, the world of nowadays. So you never know exactly which kind, what kind of film you are watching, what mm -hmm. kind of images, you know, you have in front of you. I like this mix, especially, as you say, the humoristic or even satirical part of it that it's... Uh, but pe people don't, don't laugh very much in the cinema. Maybe they are scared or they are, you know, they are... It, the mix is so ambiguous mm -hmm. of all these liars that they don't know exactly if they are allowed to, to laugh mm -hmm. of what they see. Mm -hmm. Are they meant to laugh when you wrote uh, the script, did you mean... Uh, it's not in the script, this happens a little bit spontaneously with the work of the actors. Okay. Do you improvise a lot uh, when you shoot? I don't know if it's improvised the word. I prefer to use the word uh, we, performance. We, we, we really deal with the, the, the script as if it was in a, a performance. We never repeat, for example, the scenes. We always do variations. We, uh, uh, I never decide uh, which actor will will work every day until the same day, so it's So it's they more... don't know what is going on? Yes, nobody and nobody has read this, the, the script. No? So, no. So, um, it means that improvisation, it's... I don't like this word. I prefer that we are in, in a performance, like if every day it's something unique is happening, and that's all. Mm -hmm. Because um, you said that you, uh, you've shot uh, more than 500 hours yes. for this uh, feature film. So how can you edit, uh, how can you watch so much footage and edit it? And it takes a huge amount of time, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, it takes a huge amount of time. First of all, we are three editors, we're three separate units, so we can work at the same time, you know, to, to do it faster. You, can, you simply have to calculate. I mean, if I was one editor, that it's what it's normal in films, 
that uh, it's only one editor working in a feature film. You have three. <laughs> yeah, uh, here we have three. We spend eight months of our life, seven, seven days a week without not one single day of, of, of off, mm -hmm. Need not even half a day off. Uh, we spent uh, nine days for uh, Christmas uh, at home, but apart from that, not single day off, not one single day so off. So it's non-stop. Yeah, so it means that if it was eight months with three editors, if I was alone, it will be 24 months. So it's impossible to edit the film, to spend two years just editing a film. Mm -hmm. For me, it's very <clears throat> necessary. And as I said, it's really, really hard work. And, uh, but there is no other way to do it. It's my system. I am used to it. Of course, every time when we finish the edit, we said we will never do that again <laughs> because it's too painful. But uh, there is no... You can't help it. Yeah, there is no shortcuts. If you do the films this way, you have to edit this way. Mm. What about the recognition you have here in Catalonia and Spain? Are you happy with... Yes, uh... with this film, I think that things change slightly. And now more people are interested in what I am doing, maybe because the film is more narrative, as you said. But I think it's good. It's a new start, a new point of departure. and. People will be curious for the next film, for sure. Albert, tell me about uh, your next uh, project. I know that you um, uh, are already preparing something related to uh, bullfighting. Yes, I, 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 it's a documentary. It's not it's my first documentary. In general, I am not very interested in shooting documentaries. Or, you know, I like more the fantasy and the craziness of doing a feature film, a fiction film. But here, I don't know. They asked me a long time ago to do a documentary. I didn't find an interesting subject near to me. And finally, I, I, I don't know. I thought that this, will, this was the only crazy thing, you know, around still, that still could interest me and that still could deserve to be, you know, to, to, to refocus on a documentary uh, approach. And OK, I am following now Toreros, two Toreros, you know, big stars. And mm -hmm. see, and he's focused really on on the almost spiritual approach of the the toreros uh, when they are, you know, in the in the in the arenas or and in general mm -hmm. a little bit on um, yeah. their lives, but specifically at this uh, strange moment. Uh, and it's about also commitment, you know, the, the, the really their devotion to, to to what they do. Mm -hmm. When uh, are we going to be able to, to see it? I don't know, because it's very difficult. Documentaries, you shoot, you stop shooting, then you keep on, then you follow. It's very difficult to make a plan. Okay. But probably, of course, next year or the, the, the year after, I don't know. Well, Albert, thank you so much uh, for telling us um, everything about uh, Pacifiction, everything that we wanted to know, and I'm sure the audience uh, will be grateful for it. And now, Albert, you've already been uh, on the program, so you know what the question chain uh, is. We have a random question for you from our last uh, guest. And on our first show of the season, we had uh, Melissa Stanley, who is a singer and songwriter from uh, Rosas, based in New York, and she has this question for you. Hi, I'm Melissa Stanley, and my question for you is, which is your favorite song and why? Uh, I will not say which is my favorite song, because this is very difficult. I will say which is the song I have listened to more times in my life. Mm -hmm. And okay. I don't know why, but it's um, Early Morning Rain by, uh, I think the, it's composed by Gordon Life, or uh, no, it's, uh, well, I don't know the composer. Yeah, it's, I think it's Gordon Lightfoot. And I usually uh, listen to the cover by Ian and Sylvia. Mm -hmm. Okay, great answer. I'm sure Melissa will be very satisfied with, uh, with it. Yes. Thank you, Albert. Thank you. And now in our show, we like to explore the English language a little bit. That's why we have our own teacher on the program. This is Rapid Fire English with Mark Broderick. Hello, Mark. How are you? I'm great. Thank you very Welcome much. And back. yourself? I'm great uh, and I'm very happy to have Albert here with us uh, today. Albert, most of your films are in French, but Pacifiction was also translated into English. By the way, uh, uh, the translation is by Matthew Tree, who is a contributor to this uh, show. So do you use English a lot in your films? 
not, uh, but we need to translate it just to look for finance. And it's not the only one of my films that he translated. He translated another oh. one that we never shoot at the end. It was a difficult project, but it's the second script. Ah, OK. He translated. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. Fantastic. Mark, so? Well, what if Matthew has us translated today? two films for you, then yeah. you're, you're well educated to get going with this part, OK? So well, your, your last movie was based in a French colony. So I thought of, you know, things that lost at sea. Imagine you're lost at sea and what vocabulary we might need to get back to land, OK? So the first one, your ship is about to sink, OK? And you need to, well, a ship, let's say a sailboat, OK? And you have to jump on the starboard side of, this, of the ship. Where do you go, left or right? I don't know. Let. If, let, well done, well yeah. done. You've just <laughs> saved yourself. Congratulations. You. Now, now that you've avoided certain disaster, okay, the next yeah. thing that you might have to do after there's a huge storm is put up the sail. So we have a specific verb for this in English, okay? We can mm. say hang the sail, throw the sail, or hoist the sail. What do you think? A, B, or C. Exactly. Must be C. Well done, two for Excellent. two. Matthew's a really good teacher. Huh? Yeah. I'm still be out of a job on this section. Okay, so you might think that working on a ship, sometimes you get paid for it. However, there are certain moments where people are put on a ship when they don't want to be put there, okay? They have been taken from somewhere, thrown on the ship and forced to work, okay? We have an expression which is curious for this in English, okay? So we could say, A, hey, let's Bangkok someone. B, what about let's Shanghai someone? Or C, maybe let's Tokyo someone? What do you think? It's difficult. Maybe A or B, maybe B. Well done. Ma well done, I, I think I'm going to be out of a job soon. I'm Matthew impressed. has taught you well, huh? Well done, <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, to Shanghai someone probably came from when they went to port in Shanghai, yeah. took some slaves, threw them on board. Mm -hmm. So maybe you yourself have been Shanghai in one of your movies, mm -hmm. and you don't exactly know whereabouts you are, okay? But However, you look outside, you look up high, and you see a flag. Now, the flag, of course, could be belong to pirates. But you don't know that, you know the symbol. But we have a specific name for this particular flag in English, okay? If you okay. look outside, you see the typical pirate yes. flag. Is it called the Happy Pirate, the Terrible Skull, or the Jolly Roger? Hmm. Um, maybe the last one, see? I think I'm going to have to retire my section. I think we're going to have to switch with Matthew. Well done. Congratulations. Thank you. Four from four. Congratulations Excellent. indeed, uh, well Albert. Excellent, Mark. Thank you so much. No See problem. you next week. Thank and you, Albert. Albert, thank you so much for coming today and all the best with uh, Passive Fiction. Good luck uh, with it. Okay, thank you. And we'll stick with films for a bit longer. Miquel Lopez from Televisio da Badalona is back with a few surprising facts about the woman who has probably won the most awards in the history of Hollywood. Let's take a peek at behind the scenes. Catherine Hepburn was a star during 60 years, always a leading lady. She only had a guest star role in her last movie. And also, she's the only woman who's got four Oscars with a difference of 48 years between the first and the last one. After a good beginning with Little Women and Morning Glory, her first Oscar, Hepburn's career went down in the 30s with a series of flops. But success reappeared in the 40s with the Philadelphia Story with Cary Grant and James Stewart and her films with Spencer Tracy, who was also her partner in private life. Playing basically spinsters, she filmed The African Queen with Humphrey Bogart and Summertime in the 50s. And then in the 60s, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner with Tracy, his last film, and The Lion in Winter with Peter O'Toole. For both, she won an Oscar. Her last Oscar was for On Golden Pond with Henry Fonda in 1981. From then on, her career consisted basically in appearing in not too good TV movies, but always as a leading lady. Hello, uh, Matthew and uh, Marius. So welcome there. back. Hi there. So, are you fans of Catherine Hepburn? Uh, it's been a long time since I saw a Catherine Hepburn movie, but. Um... Any favorite films? Yeah, for me, the, uh, the Queen of Africa, the African yeah. Queen. The African, African Queen. Queen, the African yeah, Queen. Yeah, with uh, Humphrey one. Bogart, and that's a very nice film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's a great, great film. I like that one as well. But I, yeah, well, the one that I remember very clearly is 
Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because that was too. a kind of breakthrough with Sidney Poitier and the, yeah. the whole business of mm -hmm. uh, a mixed couple. With it Spencer was, uh, Tracy. Yeah. With Spencer Tracy, mm -hmm. yeah. That brilliant speech uh, he gave, actually, it was his last film because uh, he died shortly after this film. Wow. Okay, so let's continue with uh, Marius. Uh, so what is the before and after <laughs> game about today? Yeah, today uh, our relevant historical fact is the coronation of Elizabeth II. I repeat, the coronation. Okay. You happen to imagine uh, when was it? I always get confused because she became queen in 1952. That's, that's when her father died, George VI. Se 70 years exactly. uh, reigning. But yeah. the coronation, ah. was it that year or the year after? I think the year after. It was the 53? year after. That's okay. it. On the uh, June the 2nd in 1953. 53. Uh -huh. So when she was 25 years old. That's it. You have to keep in mind 1953, okay. because okay. we are going to see five relevant facts and you have to imagine if they happened before or after. Excellent. So we start, start with this beautiful woman. Nuria Feliu records an LP with Lou Bennett. Lou Bennett was a very important American musician and you have to Imagine if it was before or after 1953. Okay, our second fact will be a Nobel Prize. The Nobel Prize for Literature awarded to the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Sir Winston Churchill. You have to imagine if it was before or after the Queen's coronation. Okay. Uh, Matthew, have you ever read anything, anything literary by Sir Winston Churchill? No. Never. He actually didn't write that much. He wrote, yeah, he wrote a history of the British Empire. He wrote a history of the Second World War, in which he mm, made <laughs> he out. He was the protagonist. He was, he was yeah. one of the main <laughs> characters. characters. Okay. Yeah. And but something it, about aliens also. He oh. wrote. Yeah, he was interested in flying hmm. saucers. Yeah. Okay, so you, you've yeah. got lots of information about thinking about it was before or after the coronation. Our third fact is about Tony Blair. Okay. But Tony Blair, which is younger, and the fact is that he was born a younger prime minister. Was he born before or after the Queen's coronation? That Good question. would be the thing. Mm. <laughs> the fourth one is mm -hmm. much more musical. It's about a king, Elvis Presley. Mm. Mm -hmm. Elvis okay. Presley releases Heartbreak Hotel. Did the king of rock and roll release this hit before or after? Could you? Please sing for us. Oh, this God, no. heartbreak <laughs> hotel. No, no, no. The, the whole crew would just run out of the studio, Marius, <laughs> if I started doing that. Okay, afterwards. But I know the song very well. Okay, yeah. you, you'll analyze another song afterwards. That's right. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the fifth and last is about a great queen. Again, Marilyn Monroe, this time. Mm -hmm. The film Niagara was released with Marilyn Monroe as a star. Did Marilyn appear in that film before or after? Marcella, have you seen, have you ever seen Marilyn Monroe's films? Of course, films? of course, I'm a, I'm a fan. And I think I might know the answer because oh. I did my homework. Let's, <laughs> I, okay. I'll keep silent Let's for the moment. Let's check then with all our viewers. Okay. So, first of all, I remember it was Nuria Feliu. It was before, after, Marcella, what do you see? After, right? You say after, and what about you? You are an yes. expert about Nuria Feliu. Yes, after, because I've seen the photograph, she's wearing 1960s clothes. <laughs> 1960s, so the, yeah. th that's a hint for 60s. you, the clothes. Yeah. Okay. Mid-60s, mid-60s, more or less. Both are right, it was in 1964. She started okay. as a professional in 1964 and released that long play with American Lou Bennett in 66. So mm -hmm. both, in both cases, much more after. Okay. Right, one by one. The second one was about Churchill. Ah, he was a Nobel Prize. Which year? The same year. The same year? So before or after? Ah. The same year, in 53. Well, but, right? but the coronation was in June. I would ah. say before. Okay. You say before. before. I didn't know say... we had to say the month as well. well I, <laughs> you have to say before or after. Okay, right. Before. I don't know, uh, after? You say after and you are right, because oh, Churchill course. received the Nobel Prize in Literature, but in 1953, the same year, but it was in October. Okay. So now she 
has two points and you have one, right? Okay. What about the third? Tony Blair. He was born before or after. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> what would you well, say? Why are you looking at me like that? <laughs> what would you say? No, no, question. Okay, so you asking I, me first? Yeah. yeah. He was born afterwards. Afterwards? The same year. I don't know the month. Ah, but that's, that's why you have to say before or after? Uh, before. You say before and you after? after. Well, Tony Blair was born in Edinburgh in 1953 on May the 6th, 27 <laughs> days before coronation. Okay. So that's Jesus three Christ. points for her and one for you. Okay. You have, uh, I just guessed. It's a very hard day for you. Are there any prizes? From... <laughs> <laughs> of course, <laughs> a Nobel Prize. The fourth, do you remember Elvis? What about Elvis releasing Heartbreak Hotel? Before or after? You say first, Marcella. After. After, you say? Me too, after. Both are right after. That was in January 1956 and became number one in the States immediately. Okay, so, and finally, I'm so sorry because you are 4-2, but you've, you've got your <laughs> Story partner. of my life, Marius. 4-2, <laughs> okay. Uh, then Marilyn Monroe. What about uh, Marilyn Monroe's Niagara? I know it's the same year. Again, I don't know exactly what month it was, so I'll say before. You say before? What about you? I'm not going to lose, so I'll say after. You say after, right? Niagara was exactly released on 1953, on January the 21st, <laughs> five months and days, <laughs> and 10 days before coronation, so she gets coronated today. I'm so sorry. She Thank you so queen. much, uh, okay. Marius. <laughs> well, Matthew, you can get your revenge next time. No worries. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do more homework next time. Next time. <laughs> yeah. Right, uh, Marius, so what about the guest uh, word? Yeah, we have uh, our last guest word uh, that was a portion without war. Five letters. A portion without war. What can it be? Okay, well, we'll look after that just after a very short break. We'll be right back with a look back to a classic song and the guess word. Okay, and we are back waiting for Marius's uh, solution to the guest word and with uh, Matthew, who is back uh, with the words are free. He said about uh, revealing the meaning of some of the best known songs of pop culture. We started with a 1971 song by Rod Stewart, Maggie May. So have you got uh, something a bit more recent, maybe Matthew for today? No, no? We're, we're going to go <laughs> further back actually to 1965. Okay. Uh, when Bob Dylan released what probably what I, I, I think is still one of the best songs he, he ever wrote. Okay. And he promoted it with one of the very first music videos uh, ever made. It's a famous one where he's holding up the lyric cards like, like these and then just throwing them away. Oh, yeah. No, not only that, uh, the second line, just the second line says, I'm on the pavement thinking about the government. Now, thinking about the government in 1964 meant that you're thinking about the war in Vietnam. So there's a, a protest element there as, as well. Okay. Um, there is something I didn't quite uh, catch, something about a fire hose? Yeah, that came in at the end of the clip that we've seen. It says, better stay away from those that carry around a fire hose. And that's a deliberate uh, reference to the civil rights protests in the southern states of America when the police turned hoses, high pressure water hoses, yeah. on black mm -hmm. protesters. Um, but I'd say the, the main theme of the song is what a tough time young people are in for in the 1960s because a lot of the lines begin with the phrase, look out kid. 
and maybe the one that's most representative is, look out kid, it's something you did, God knows when, but you're doing it again. In other words, no matter what you do, mm -hmm. they're going to find that it's wrong, mm -hmm. something which it seems to me still happens uh, today. And, and it's very emblematic, this uh, visually, all these usage of uh, the, the lyrics yeah. showing. There have been uh, lots of people afterwards doing the same thing, yeah. um, copying. It's him, been copied right? time. Yeah. There's even a, a mm -hmm. modern version of this, of this with the of same, this same song yeah. done like that. And finally, uh, towards the end of the song, Dylan adds, uh, talking about young people, 20 years schooling and they put you on the day shift. In other words, uh, you've got all this education, you've got yeah. all this potential and mm -hmm. you're going to end up getting some lousy job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, amazing, no? How, what he managed to to get uh, to to transmit in just over two minutes. Just over two minutes, he gets all of that uh, in, but uh, he didn't do it all on his own. Um, he himself admitted he, that he got a lot of support of a Chuck Berry song from 1956 called "Too Much Monkey oh, okay. Business," oh. which is about how the system is always trying to cheat you. And we've got a very very short example of that coming up. Every day getting up, going to school, and even you complaining your objections overruled. Yeah. Too much monkey business. Too much monkey business. Too much monkey business for me to be in my day. There's Keith Richards there giving him yeah, a helping yeah. hand. Mm -hmm. For those who didn't quite catch the lyric, it says, same thing every day, getting up, going to school, no need for me to complain, my objections overruled, too much monkey business. In other words, too mm -hmm. much mm, illegal stuff, wrong stuff happening, too much monkey business. Mm -hmm. So there you go. It's one of Dylan's very best songs, written with the help of the Beat Generation and a specific song by Chuck Berry. Mm -hmm. Well, that was uh, amazing. Thank you, uh, Matthew, and I hope next week maybe you can uh, play us something more up to date. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't know what, but yes. <laughs> okay. yeah. It will coronation. be a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> yes. After the coronation. That's yeah. it. Okay, Marius, so uh, it's time uh, for the answer to last week's uh, guest word. Yeah, and now I see that it's quite linked to Matthew's song, to this Bob Dylan song, because a portion without war, five letters, was... Peace. Peace, Peace. Of, course, of course, uh written you've got a portion written with I E, but uh, it's homophone, it sounds the same than peace written with E A, right? So that mm -hmm. was the answer. Mm -hmm. And now we've got a new one okay. which we, will be much more difficult, and this is the one. A sign in our inst intestine. Five letters. A sign in our intestine. Five letters. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can try and guess our guest word. You can find it and post your answer on our social media profiles. Uh, Marius will be here next Saturday with the solution uh, and uh, as will Matthew with a song. Uh, see you both uh, next week. Thank you. Okay. See you next week. Bye -bye. And now it's time for another new section about science. Our contributor, Dr. Matthew Murtha, is already waiting, so let's go for it. Let's say hello to our own science correspondent, Dr. Matt Murtha. Welcome, Matt. Thanks for having me. It's great to be back. It's great to see you in this uh, white uh, lab coat. It suits you very well. Thank you. It's, uh, it's, it's really nice to be wearing one here at the Weekly Mag. You're welcome. Okay, well, as you all know, Matt has been on our show lots of times, uh, mostly as a reporter and a comedian. But in case you didn't know, well, it turns out that he also holds a PhD in molecular biology. That's right. I actually moved to Barcelona to work in the cancer laboratory of Dr. Manel Esteller, one of mm. Catalonia's most yeah. famous researchers. He was here on the show uh, twice. Oh, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I think he's a brilliant scientist. Yes, indeed. Okay, Matt, so today you came here to teach us uh, something, which is? Genetics. So genetics. I thought we could talk today a little bit about genetics, and in order to understand it better, I brought us an experiment that we can okay. do together. Sounds good. So um, genetics uh, sounds a uh, very difficult uh, topic, at least for me, because I don't have a scientific mind. So uh, I would like to ask you to explain it to us in simple words so that everybody can understand. Of course. I know it sounds complicated, but it, it's really kind of simple to understand. Okay. So you have to understand genetics, the genome, 
we're talking about DNA, or as they say here in Spain, ADN, DNA, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I yeah, think that's how exactly. they say it. The DNA is a chemical that makes up your genome. And all you need mm -hmm. to know about the genome is that it's the cookbook of life, all right? Okay. The genome is your instruction, your body's instructions to make your entire body from your brain cells down to the skin cells in your toes. All right, so we can find the information for the whole body in every one of the cells? Each and is every one correct? of your cells, that's correct. Okay, so today, uh, what are you going to do? So today I thought we could isolate some DNA from bananas. Mm -hmm. This is a very easy experiment. You can do well, it at it home. It sounds difficult. Oh no, I promise <laughs> it's easy. All Look, right. if I can do it, anybody can, all right? Okay, so to start, it's pretty simple. You start with a banana. Uh, mm -hmm. Feel free to use an old banana that's gone a little past due. Um, and then you're just, what we're gonna do is we're gonna break up the banana in a glass here. Mm -hmm. So if you don't know, banana is the fruit of a banana tree, right? <laughs> and it contains... I think we all know that. All right, well, I, you never know. Mm -hmm. it contains okay. a whole lot of cells, yeah? So what we're gonna try to do is break apart the cells so that we can isolate the DNA or the genome from the center of each cell. Mm -hmm. okay. So the first step is to manually break it apart. You wanna just smash it up uh, into a consistency almost like a pudding, yeah? Mm-hmm. So you're not going to make a banana cake or something? No, uh, you won't want to eat what's left <laughs> after this. But Anyway, it smells uh, really well, but right now it looks like something you might find in a kid's school satchel. Yeah, if mm -hmm. you've had children, this is pretty much what you feed a newborn, I believe, right? That's right. Okay, so after this, Okay, so once you have it all smashed up into a nice uh, pudding-like paste, okay. you add some warm salt water. So just regular table salt. Salt water. Yeah. Okay. If you have about 500 mils of water, you want to add maybe 100 grams of salt. Again, in simple at-home science like this, it, the, the precise concentrations don't matter. In a laboratory, you want to be exact though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So you just add the salt water to the banana, and then we'll mix it up again. Now I find, what I find, one thing I find interesting, Marcella, is that performing science, I believe, is a lot like cooking, right? Because mm -hmm. every day you follow a re recipe exactly, and you have to add a, the precise amount of ingredients to each and everything. Okay, but here you can't improvise, right? No, you, you need should to not. Do, you need to use the exact uh, amount yeah. of each ingredient. And that's actually probably why I was a, a bad scientist. Because I like, as you can tell, I like to improvise. I just add a pinch of this and mm -hmm. a pinch of that. It's kind of like an old lady cooking. I see. Well, you can, uh, you can be a good uh, chef, but uh, probably not a very good uh, pastry chef. Because uh, in pastry, you need to use the exact ingredients. Ah, that's right. Okay, so science is more like, being, more like baking or being a pastry chef. Because cooking, yeah, you can improvise, you do not want to improvise in science. Okay, so what happened here with this combination of bananas and salt water? Right, so the salt water creates an osmotic pressure, which is a fancy term for breaking apart the cells, yeah? And now we have this mixture, we're gonna add a little bit of detergent, just liquid dish soap is fine. Like soap. Yeah, around two milliliters. Mm -hmm. And this will further break apart the cells and then also cause all the cell debris, so the cell walls, the different other parts of the cells that we're not interested in, it'll cause that all to clump, yeah? Right. So we just mix this gently, try not to make too many bubbles. Mm-hmm. Et voila. So is this what you do in the lab? <laughs> uh, in a general sense, we are much more particular and much more precise in the laboratory. In a laboratory, also you want to pre uh, prevent contamination, so you wear you wear gloves, you wear safety goggles, you wear a nice laboratory uh, <laughs> coat. Okay. And the other big difference between what we're doing here today and what happens in a lab is in a laboratory, you have to repeat your experiments multiple times to make sure that the thing that you're seeing is actually happening because of what you think is happening. But here for today, yeah, we're having fun. We're just doing an easy demonstration. We are isolating DNA, but but again, Matt, why would you want to isolate uh, DNA? Well, it's fantastic because once you isolate the DNA, then you can do experiments on the DNA. You can actually mm -hmm. find out what the DNA is doing in one cell type versus another. Okay. I don't know if you know this, but uh, researchers in Scotland actually cloned a sheep 
Yeah. Yeah, I heard about Dolly it. Dolly the sheep back exactly. in the 90s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were able to do this because they were able to isolate the DNA from okay. a skin cell of the mm -hmm. sheep. I see. Now, uh, to get back to the experiment really quick, once you have added the detergent to your banana salt water mixture, you want to mm -hmm. filter it. I'm using just a teapot, but you can use okay. a paper towel or a coffee filter, anything mm -hmm. to remove the big chunks of banana from okay. the, the liquid. Mm, mm, mm. Smells like science. <laughs> All right, so what this? What does it mean? What happened now? Okay, so now we're filtering away all the big chunks of, cell, of the cells that we don't want. And all that's left is a bit of water with our DNA inside. So we're gonna pour that DNA mixture into a new glass. Again, trying to avoid bubbles as much as possible, just for cleanliness. And then the last step is to add a bit of al alcohol. Mm -hmm. Ideally, Which... you'd use isopropyl alcohol, but ethanol alcohol is fine. 96% is, is best pure. And then you just add a little bit to the top here. What's gonna happen is the alcohol has chemical properties that causes the DNA to precipitate or to form physical little clumps. Okay. And what we'll see is that the DNA is gonna form these little gooey strings uh, on top in the clear layer. And that will So, be... probably a silly question, but doesn't the alcohol destroy the DNA? No, no it does not. It actually causes the DNA to form a precipitate or almost like a crystal-like stru structure. Mm -hmm. The alcohol will destroy a cell though, and that's why you don't want to mix alcohols and cells together. So you have this, this uh, banana DNA, right? Mm -hmm. But what about human tissue instead of bananas? Can that help to cure diseases? That's right. So every day we use much more sophisticated techniques, but we isolate DNA from uh, all, all sorts of disease cases like cancer, mm -hmm. and then we can study that. Okay. Now, I just want to point out at the top here, you have the purified DNA. It's this kind of white, gooey, crystalline structure at the top. Now, I've prepared one earlier. Okay. And that's, if ah, we let that different. rest for a little while, mm -hmm. yeah, it'll come out looking like that. Okay, so, so uh, tell me more about uh, why is it important in science to, to do this, to isolate uh, DNA? Well, I, DNA being the cookbook of life, it's mm -hmm. the instruction manual that tells your body to make a cell or a toe cell, uh, an eye cell or a toe cell, right? And so by understanding how this instruction booklet works, we can understand how it goes wrong in diseases. And then we can actually affect change. We can make cures for diseases by understanding how the DNA works. Mm -hmm. Can you give me an example of how this is applied in science uh, at the moment? Well, one fun example is um, by studying these processes, I don't know if you know this, but Microsoft is currently developing little robots to identify cancer cells in your bloodstream. And they go in your bloodstream, they identify a cancer cell and make it lice or explode. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that's fascinating because as a biologist, we say something that infects a cell makes it lice or explode. We call that a virus. Uh -huh. Microsoft, they call that an operating system. <laughs> hey? Okay. I wrote that joke in 1995, A joke guys. from uh, Matthew, as usual. I was wondering when you were telling us a joke. I'll get there eventually, mm -hmm. yeah. A scientific uh, joke. And voila, your DNA is ready. Mm -hmm. Looks uh, amazing. Um, it's, it's incredible how much we learned, how much science we learned uh, today from uh, Matthew. It was fun. Uh, we knew that you can't uh, separate the scientist from the comedian. So um, uh, it was uh, great to see you again, uh, Matthew, and see you next time with more uh, science experiments. Well, thanks for having me. It was great to experiment with you, Marcella. Okay, now we'll be traveling to Austria. It's time for our worldwide talk. Anna Brull is an award-winning mezzo-soprano from Lampoglia in the Basch Ebra who has built a fantastic career in Austria. She is a uh, member of the cast at the Opera of the City of Graz where she has just begun her 10th season as a solist. Let's celebrate it with her. Uh, Anna, welcome to the Weekly Mag. Hello. Hello, it's a pleasure. Anna, first of all, congratulations on your 10th year at the Opera of uh, Graz. How do you feel about that? Well, well, now that I've heard you telling that, I'm, I, I'm very happy and very thankful. 
Anna, in November, you will be performing in Catalan, uh, in Madrid, with the opera Els Diálogos de Tirán y Carmesina. Is that the first time you'll be singing in uh, Catalan, in your mother tongue? Yes, and this is, for me, a very nice thing. I'm really looking for it because, um, I mean, it's a very good story. Everyone knows it and it's written in uh, a Catalan, but which is very close to my dialect. I mean, the, this Cat Valencia, Valencia. No? I, am, uh, I am really, really, really looking forward to it. And I also have a very good role to play because I play two roles on the same time with this mm. yin and yang, the, the La Viuda and Playa de la Vida. So it will be also the first time in which I'm playing two roles in the same opera. It's quite so, a challenge. Yes, and I mean, I, I used to sing in four or five languages, uh, so, and I never sang in, in Catalan. Yes, so uh, I'm really looking for it because it has a, a meaning for me, yes. Uh, Anna, in 2017, you won the Musical Theatre Awards of Austria as the best uh, new female artist. So I guess that award was a turning point in your career. A very important award, but, uh, and uh, it was a prize also for, for me to keep going and keep going doing my job. But I received the prize more than one and a half years later when the job was done. So. I don't know if you understand what I mean. Yeah, uh, sure. I was doing a completely new things, and then I got the nomination for this role. I, I, I already, uh, well, of course, I will never forget it. And <laughs> it was one of the best things I did in my life. But the prize came. And, um, I got recognition in my country. I got recognition in Catalonia. So this this is nice because I've never sung in Barcelona. So <laughs> Yes. I guess it's always nice to be and, recognized, uh, no? And uh, it's a great yes. achievement. Congratulations uh, for that you. as well. Thank you. Uh, what I wanted to say is, of course, I'm very thankful, but uh, it, I keep doing every day the same quality of work, it, it, even if the price is there or not. That's what I wanted to, to say. Uh, Anna, let's see if uh, I uh, get this right. You've played uh, more than uh, 30 opera roles. What is your favorite uh, opera? It's very difficult to say that because, because I am in, a, in, a, in an opera house, in an ensemble. One of the things I like and one of the things that I still, I'm still here is that I get to do many, many things and I get to try many different genres. Uh, how do you say genres? Um, so I don't only do I I do opera, and Rosina. Th th this role I did in Il Barbiere di Siviglia. This, this is the role I did. Uh, I got the prize for it. This was a very a fantastic role, and I would I did. But I what I wanted to mention is I also do operetta, and I also had the chance to do um, a fantastic. Uh, Operita, tango operita, which is called Maria de Buenos Aires, which is not an opera, but also um, a, a piece. Uh, Piazzolla, the composer, said operita because he said it's a little opera. I don't try myself to say this is an opera, but for me, it's one of the greatest things I did in my life. I, I'm not concentrated only in what we understand as opera, but in the singing staging world i also did a musical this summer i did evita the musical this summer which i'm very happy i could do this this experience also to dance and to play with a microphone it's it's not the same but you're always on stage and uh, so i'm now in this period of my life Excellent. So, uh, yeah <laughs> trying a little bit of uh, everything uh, Anna, you have studied in Catalonia and Belgium and also in Italy, but what made, made you decide um, staying in Austria after all? Graz uh, is uh, a very nice city and I got the job here in 2013. I started in the opera studio, which is uh, an opera <laughs> studio. I was a young uh, beginner. And uh, after two years of studio, I stayed in, a, in the ensemble 
And I don't know if you can show pictures of the Opera House, but it's a wonderful, for me, it's the best, it's the most beautiful Opera House. Uh, and um, I'm, I, I like the work here. Um, I also like to go abroad and see what's outside, but I like to say that the Opera in Graz is my house. And I have my my life also. I build in my life here. So, um, yeah. so tell us more about your life in uh, Austria. What is it like living in Graz? Well, my life uh, it's conditioned all the time with the theater. So um, I cannot say I have a very Austrian life because my timetables are quite Spanish or quite Mediterranean. I don't know <laughs> if we want to say. So, so I start working. At 10 o'clock in the morning, we okay. have the, 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 the rehearsals at That's 10 o'clock in the morning. That's quite late for Austria, right? To wake up at 9, it's very late <laughs> in Austria, yes. Okay. So, uh, yeah, the rehearsals are 10 to 1 and uh, in the evening if we have performance. The performances are at 7.30 in the evening. Okay, Anna, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Good luck uh, with all your projects. Thank you. And now we want to say hello to a good friend of ours who we haven't uh, seen for um, a few months, uh, Auntie Polly, of course. Hello, great to see you. Hi how are you? Much, and how was your summer? Oh, it was lovely. I went to Calella in the Maresma. Really? Not so, nice. Not so nice. But then afterwards I went to London, you know, to pay my respect to the Queen. Yeah. It was such a sad, yeah, so, so that's why I'm in mourning, you yeah, see. Yeah, I can see that. But, but I was waiting on queue for 24 hours, can you believe it? it was just yeah. It was the best time of my life. Yeah, actually. I followed it on uh, TV. So, did you uh, yeah. meet anybody famous, such as? Well, I, don't I know, saw some people. Maybe jumping David the queue. Beckham. Yes. How could you tell? You could see my <laughs> face. Yeah, she, he's amazing. He's so good looking, and it was wonderful to be in queue, talking about engaging things such as the weather, the price of milk. It mm -hmm. was really lovely. And then Marcella, I just when I was in front of the Queen and I saw her there, you know, the coffin. I just. I did a reverence, like the, you know, a curtsy, but it wasn't enough. So I just so. went down, you know, okay. down. Oh, I went down, 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 completely down. And then I, sorry, I just, I couldn't get up just no, like yeah, now. Okay? Excuse me. Uh, Do sorry. you need any help? Could you, yes, thank you. Oh, okay, thank you, oh, Tony. Tony, you come to the rescue. Tony, <laughs> Tony. Wonderful. Oh, this is a cheap carpet, isn't it? IKEA. Thank right? you so much, Tony. Oh. Are you okay, Auntie Polly? Yes, I'm all right. Thank you. Oh, yes. Thanks, God. Okay, so I guess your niece, Nuria Barnett, couldn't make it uh, again. She is busy. She's I a take busy it. bee, you know? Mm -hmm. She's very busy, but never mind her. I <laughs> was so taken by this. Okay, that I had to and go you brought to a report? Yes, I, I had to go to the Parc de la Ciutadella, you see, mm -hmm. to to talk to people about the Queen, because I, feel, I was feeling so sad. And we, we did amazing things, you know, we danced to her favorite song, heaven, I'm in heaven. We did an offering to her, a tea offering, of course, really? her favorite, Earl Grey, okay. so many things. Sounds brilliant, we'll watch it just after a very, very short break, so stick around. Okay, we're back with Auntie Polly and her video about the Queen of uh, England. Check it out. Dear Weekly Mag fans, I'm so happy to be back and so sad about the circumstances. In the aftermath of Queen Elizabeth's death, I've come here to this lovely park to find solace on the people and also to find out how much they really knew about Queen Elizabeth. Here we go. Oh, what a beautiful morning. So, how do you guys feel about the passing of Queen Elizabeth? Quite honestly, I think it's tragic for, for the Commonwealth because she was a perfect example of what serv service to country was. God save the Queen! Do you think that King Charles III is going to do such a good job? I think he will. God save the King! It just doesn't have the same ring to it. I prefer this one. God save the Queen! It's so beautiful. Oh, God. If you think of Queen Elizabeth, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Well, scandals in the royal family. Oh, you are so right, aren't you? They're so mischievous. Oh, 
такой чил за себя. of Queen Elizabeth, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? She's like everybody's grandma. She is, and she's just like me. Do you feel the same with me? <laughs> One, two, three. And go, 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 careful with the water. Wonderful. How do you feel about the Queen Elizabeth's death? Um, well, I am a Republican, an Irish Republican, so I'm not very interested in what happens to the Queen. But I not support the monarchy either, you know. Uh, so I, I, I am different. God help you. Thank you very much. Oh my Lord, let's go. God save the precious King Kong. It just doesn't. It doesn't come natural to me. I can't do it. It'll have to be some time before I can do this. Screw, screw, screw. Wonderful. That's the royal way for you boys. If you think of Queen, do you think of Buckingham Palace or Bohemian Rhapsody? Buckingham Palace. Or Buckingham Palace. Heaven, I'm in heaven, and my heart... When you think of Queen Elizabeth, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? I thought she was, she was eternal. Like, she was there throughout my whole life. When we're off together dancing cheek to cheek. Well, dear Weekly Mag fans, I've realized that Elizabeth meant a lot to lots of people. So I'm going to start a petition at change.org to get the name of my country changed from United Kingdom to United Queendom. And now I'm going to fly away and see if I can find dear Lilibet up in the clouds. Bye! Right, so, hi, if you could just put your number there and your national ID card and your telephone number. You hipster, you. <laughs> Auntie Polly, yeah? thank you so much for your report. Sorry. Yes, it's okay. So, Auntie Polly, that was a, a great uh, feature uh, indeed. So, tell me, do you think most people will miss uh, Queen uh, Elizabeth? Well, of course, Marcella. Everyone will miss. Yeah. Uh, yeah, everyone except for the <laughs> Republicans. Can I say that word here? <laughs> Republicans, Jesus. We haven't heard anything. Mm, yeah, no. Normal people will miss her, but not Republicans for sure. Goodness yeah. me. So, um, tell us more uh, about uh, this amazing event, which was well, uh, the ceremony. Well, you know, it was inspired. Of rather based on her, her father's funeral, which was 70 years ago. Mm -hmm. In fact, the irony of it all, it was she wasn't supposed to be the queen, do you know? Yeah, yeah it was all the fault of Mrs. Simpson, not <laughs> much um, Homer Simpson's wife, no, but Mrs. Wallace Simpson, you know, mm -hmm. who King George yeah. VI, he was beautiful, you know, such a star, a bit of a Nazi, but very nice. He fell in love with her, he wanted to marry her, but he couldn't because she was a divorcee, mm -hmm. you know, and so what happened? That he abdicated in a whim, and so he he passed the crown to his brother, Elizabeth's father, who could not talk for the love like me. He was stuttering, stuttering. So anyway, he learned Such to speak. Such a huge speak. scandal. Yes, he learned to speak and then he died. Could you die? Yeah. How dare he? I mean, he died. Elizabeth was 25 years old. Yeah. She was in South Africa. You said that before with the elephant, you know, and Prince Silk. And, and she reigned for 70 years. Yes, she did. It, it was, was a very emotional uh, ceremony, wasn't absolutely. it? Absolutely. Was did you see the corgis? Oh, I, I, well, I saw them on the television. Yeah, it was they, so sad. Yes, they're going to Prince Andrew, do you know that? Mm -hmm. It was a bit of a groomer. And Emma, even the pony, Emma. Yes, yeah. it's very, very sad. And she, she touched everybody. She had so many things in common with the king. Not the king, King Charles III, you know, the third three sticks up his ass, he's got no. <laughs> King the Elvis Presley, you know, they both died on the throne. The yeah. same, absolutely, such an undignified death on the one case, undignified on the other. Well, oh, Auntie so Polly, thank you so much for coming today. Thank you for this uh, great report. And I guess we'll be seeing you soon, right? Yes, of course you will. Hopefully in happier circumstances. Me too, I hope so as well. Uh, thank you again, Auntie Polly. And now it's time for some TV series and uh, something extra. Watch this. He was a monster. The founding father of Gilead. He took away our country. Hello, Tony. Welcome back. Hi. How are you? And uh, welcome, Marta Royo. Hello. Nice to meet you again. Hello. It's a pleasure to uh, have you here with us, uh, Marta. Marta is a new contributor. She'll be talking about branding and 
advertising. So we are really happy to, uh, to start uh, with, uh, with branding today. I, I know you have a special topic which is a lot in the news uh, yeah. these days uh, yeah. and uh, we'll be talking about uh, that a little bit uh, later but now it's time for TV series with uh, Tony. So this week I know you want to begin by talking about the new season of The Handmaid's uh, Tale. Yeah, it's not the last one. I mean a lot of people it's not are... The last no, one. a lot of people are saying, is this the last one? No, it isn't. It should be probably. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. It should be, yeah, it should be. I think that's the, that's the key of this TV series. It should be the last one because it's a TV series that it, it really uh, has very little to tell because the story of June Osborne has, it's, has been very long and it's a character that has suffered very much uh, through the series. Too much. And I, yeah, too much. <laughs> too and long. I think a lot of uh, the viewers think <clears throat> exactly that. It's too much and um, most people have uh, is fed up, you know, about <laughs> all this suffering. I don't know if it's your case, if you've been... Haven't seen it. Well, I must confess that I kind of disconnected um, after the first or second season. Yeah, a lot of a people did that. A long time ago. Yeah. A long time ago, yeah. so... Well, the good news is <clears throat> now it's a time to get back, if you want to get back to the series, because finally the, the payback has begun, mm -hmm. uh, because June wants uh, to get revenge against Gilead, and it's quite satisfactory seeing her getting her payback, of course, and at the same time it's clear she's not okay, you know, that she, she needs this payback in a way that it's in fact a problem. Mm -hmm. Right, what about uh, the main actress, uh, Elizabeth uh, Moss? I guess yeah. she's still great uh, yeah. in the role. Yeah, she's great, but I think the TV series is relying too much on her. You know, like everything has to be solved in a close-up uh, of her face. And well, she can pull it off and she's great making her character completely the range but it's a trick that they use too often i think mm -hmm. well like you said the tony too much is uh, too much <laughs> yeah <laughs> and um, well um, it's sometimes important to know uh, when to stop yeah of course that's which why it doesn't seem to be the case uh, yeah. here no it's not the case and that's why uh, i brought you a selection of mini series that really kept okay, it short brilliant. Okay, okay. we can start with uh, Quarry. It's a TV series about an American soldier who comes back home from Vietnam. Mm -hmm. It only lasted one season, it was cancelled, but it was really great. And then Olive Kidridge uh, has a great performance by Frances McDormand playing an angered woman in a small town. It's based on a great novel as well. Then we could go to Time, which is a prison drama that will hit you very hard and has Stephen Graham and Sean Bean as lead actors, great actors, both of them, I mm -hmm. think. Wow. Then mm -hmm. in field you'll find two real actresses, Susan Sarandon and Jessica Lange playing two other great actresses, Beth Davis and Joan Crawford. They hated each other and that makes for a great mini-series. Mm -hmm. And finally, I will yeah, I put see in that. the... Yeah, I that's, see that one is really good. Uh, but my top one uh, has to be The Plot Against America, which okay. is an adaptation of the book by Philip Roth that imagines an anti-Semitic party winning the elections in the US. David Simon uh, made the book into a perfect miniseries, which at the time was also a comment on Donald Trump. And I think it's interesting to see, you know, both, uh, uh, both views of the same story, uh, Philip Ross one and, and David Simon's one. Mm -hmm. They complement it very well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, any other TV series, Tony, that you'd like to recommend apart mm -hmm. from these ones? Okay, well, uh, are you into boxing? <laughs> is, that, um, is that a is that direct a question? question? Like a, like like a, <laughs> it's a punch question <laughs> for you. Question. Sorry, no. No, you're not. <laughs> Me neither. Neither do I. <laughs> okay. Well, but I enjoyed this TV series, this TV series about Mike Tyson. I enjoyed it very much. I do not like boxing at all, but I enjoyed it very much because I think it makes you understand the main character. Mm -hmm. And it's not about boxing, really. It's about love. Uh, Mike Tyson love. was, yeah because uh, he was not loved uh, at all as a kid, not by his family, nor by the people around him. In, in fact, he was bullied in his own neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And if he became a boxer, it was because he was trying to be loved by someone. 
in this case by his coach, who made him go through some very tough training. Mm -hmm. So this TV series is a bit more emotional than you'd think uh, when, you know, boxing. I see. You, in interesting. You won't expect that. So was uh, Mike Tyson involved in the series no, himself? No, and, and he's very angry about it. In really? Fact, he didn't like yes, it? at all. I, at the beginning, I didn't understand why, because they tried to make him a very sympathetic character, but then it gets, there's an episode, a specific episode that uh, tells a very violent episode of his life, uh, a violent episode outside the ring, not, not a violent boxing episode, it's other stuff. And I think uh, that's the episode that the, the miniseries uses to make a turn on the character. And I found it very interesting, mm -hmm. but I also understand why he's not comfortable with I see. that miniseries after that. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yes. I hear that uh, Johnny Rothen is not as well comfortable with uh, doing now something about a series about sex pistols. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, I don't he, know if we will talk about him uh, later, but yeah. I think it's about the Disney, that it's the, the productor of, of Yeah, the yeah, he's not, he's not happy with it either, no. Really? no. Mm -hmm. I can say why, I think. In, in this case, I can say why, because I very enjoyed, uh, I very much enjoyed this TV series that charts the rise of the Sex Pistols in the British music scene of the 70s. The soundtrack is fantastic and the work of the actors is spot on. Danny Boyle directs it with style and I think it contextualizes punk music very well as a movement that came up because of the situation of young people in the era of Margaret Thatcher. But mm -hmm. as you said, the TV series is on Disney Plus yes. and I think Johnny uh, Rotten is right when he says this is not, it's a bit contradictory for the Sex Pistols to be associated with uh, the Disney run. Mm -hmm. And okay. well, uh, they, they voted about it uh, and the rest of the, the remain members of the band voted in favor of the TV series, so he has to, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Okay, I guess uh, we can call that direct uh, democracy. Yeah, that, no? we can Tony? call it, yeah, that's true. Excellent. And now let's talk about uh, branding and uh, advertising with uh, Marta Royo Spinet, uh, who is an advertiser. She runs her own uh, consultancy here in uh, Barcelona, and she's also written the book Aromada Marca because brands are very, very important, uh, Marta, aren't they? First of all, I am very happy to be here. Thanks for uh, the trust in me in this, Thanks for coming, in this Marta. program. And as you said, uh, for, ev for every business, uh, for every uh, company, and even for, even, for every uh, person, it's very important to have uh, your own mark created. First of all, created, and then when it is created, it is the moment of, of uh, telling it to everybody. But mm -hmm. first of all, we have it okay. to create. Mm -hmm. Actually, Marta, we are surrounded by uh, brands yes. everywhere, uh, but let's have uh, a specific example. Yes, uh, I think that uh, during the, these days we have had uh, a specific example of a, a brand, a world brand, that it has been the Queen Elizabeth II. Of course. The second. Uh, she is probably the most, uh, the most popular brand in the UK. Yes, and in the moment, for example, um, hours after her death, a GN image of, of the Queen was displayed in Piccadilly Circus in London as a spot typically, uh, a, a blackboard typically uh, that was reserved for uh, big brands companies. And in that moment, the big brand of the moment yeah. was the Queen. Mm -hmm. It seems like an advertising. Yes, it's, it's like an advertising and people doing a lot of cues here to, to, to see and to watch just this, that the, the, the Just queen, the picture. Yes, just mm -hmm. the picture that the Queen had that. That's it. Very powerful uh, indeed. Because the British monarchy, uh, I think that it's not just the Queen, it's the British monarchy, because it has um, mm -hmm. on the whole a lot of brand extensions, no? The, the institution, the crown, the Commonwealth as well, mm -hmm. uh, the royal family, its individual members, and um, all the things that, that represents the, the monarchy, no? The, the pins, the levels of uh, some brands, some brands have uh, used. Mm -hmm. the level of the, the shield yeah. of the monarchy mm -hmm. to, the, to represent that its product is uh, allowed for, for, the, for eating for the royal family. It's very curious because the, the product that they have, the, the skill in that level, is that they are allowed to be, to be consumed for the royal monarchy and, and, the, and the royal See, the people. The product has the crown blessing. Yes, <laughs> yes. But also other uh, organizations um, use the royal uh, prefix as well, not just the, the image. Okay, for, example, for example, the, the Royal Opera House in London. 
its logo, right. as you can see. And then the banner, banner as well. The banner huh? of the of the homepage of the website. Anyway, so um, every brand, Marta, needs some values, I suppose, to be yes. associated with. So when we're talking about brands, we're also talking about values. Values are very important in uh, brands. Is that right? Yes, it is, it is like this because one thing is a product and another thing is a brand. Products there are a lot and are, they are all indifferentiated, mm -hmm. but um, the brand is when you have uh, your own personality, what we call the brand promise. The brand but promise. Promise. Mm, okay. For example, I didn't um, know that. You can think about the brand of Queen Elizabeth, or we can think about the brand of the, the king of Spain, Felipe. It's a brand because, for example, uh, in 1947, a speech that she made in South Africa, when she was already uh, Princess Elizabeth, mm -hmm. she said that uh, she wanted to be her life a life of service. So that was a key um, uh, expression, uh, a key, well, it's not a word, it's an expression, it yes. was key in, uh, in all her reign. Yes, right? that's it. And on why did she, what, what does it mean, a life of uh, service? What did she exactly say? I think that she wants to be seen uh, like, a, like a normal, in between brackets, if you allowed me this word, citizen of the, of the, of the UK. I remember that speech from the Crown, uh -huh. in fact. Well, she was a perfect uh, example, like you said, of uh, uh, brand yeah. uh, success. We'll see what will happen with the, the King Charles uh, III, if he is uh, going to succeed in maintaining the British uh, monarchy's uh, brand. Thank you so much for joining us uh, today. Uh, see you next time. Anthony, thank you. See you soon it's a pleasure uh, as, as well. And now let's finish with some music from our guest uh, artist. Check this out. Soledad, Joan Surdez, uh, latest music video with Elena Miquel and Joan Masdeo, which uh, just uh, came out yesterday. It's the Catalan version of the song from his second album called Far, that is Lighthouse in English. Let's uh, find out uh, more about Joan Surde and his album. Joan, welcome to the Weekly Mag. Thank you. You didn't come alone, you came accompanied by Haldor Mar. Welcome again, Haldor, because you. Uh, you were here before on this yeah, show. Yeah, we, we talked before, yeah. Exactly. Okay, so let's talk about uh, this uh, new album uh, called uh, Far. Tell me uh, more about it. Well, uh, it's my second album, full second full album. Um, it w it's an album that it came uh, eight years ago from the last album. It was called Reventando mm -hmm. eight years ago. So in this period of time, I only released uh, a single, so it's a long silence because, well, I was in the other side of the industry for many years. Uh, you are also a producer. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, um, we're talking about LCM uh, Records, uh, La Cupula Music. Yes. Which uh, you run and, uh, well, you produced uh, this album mm -hmm. yourself. And it was also uh, crowdfunded uh, as well as just like your first album. Yes. What are the advantages of uh, crowdfunding? You can have the budget to finish all the process. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, you don't have all the budget, but you can pay some rewards. Okay. And also, it's, you can have an idea of the expectation of the audience. Okay, well, and um, Haldormar um, features in one of the songs, uh, um, number nine on, uh, on this album, called uh, Brilla a la Vida. Uh, Brilla tell la vida, me yes. more about this song, Haldor. Uh, it's, a, it's a ballad, it's a very nice ballad, and uh, when he, he, he actually gave me a few songs to choose from, so I could choose uh, one of them, but I, I really like that one. And it's a, it's a beautiful song, uh, it's in Catalan, of course, but it talks about uh, you know when a relationship is over, how how you you know how you, and it's actually very positive. It's like it's like a breakup song, 
but in a positive way. And I thought that was really interesting that you can break up with someone uh, with the relationship you had for a time, some time. And uh, but you know you're kind of grateful because you um, you have had good times with this person. But you, if you if you don't look at the bad stuff, you can really learn and you can really grow and uh, and remember the the good parts of the relationship. So it's a, it's a breakup song. It's a positive attitude, I think. Mm -hmm. Haldor, a little bird uh, told me that you are also preparing uh, a new album and That's true. you are uh, going to finish soon uh, a new song. Very soon, yeah, very soon. Uh, I, I have a single coming out. and, uh, and But at the beginnings of next year, 2023, it should come out uh, okay. in its entirety, yeah. So I'll just take the opportunity to invite you to present uh, to present the new song Perfect. here at the Weekly Mag. That's great. That's great. Okay. I'll be here. I'll be here. Okay, I'll take your word for it and can't wait. Looking forward to it. Okay, well, Haldo and Joana, thank you so much for coming today at the Weekly Mag. Good luck with all your projects. Thank, thank you so you. much. And this is the end of our show where today. We'll leave you with Joan Surden accompanied by Haldo Mar and their cover of Forever Young. Tune in to the Weekly Mag next week for more interviews, reports, games, music and many other surprises. Until then, you've got the guest word by Marius Serra. Can you crack it? This is the clue. A sign in our intestine. That's five letters. Thanks for watching and have a great week. Bye bye. Let's dance in style, let's dance for a while Heaven can wait, we're only watching the skies Hoping for the best, but expecting the worst Are you gonna drop the bomb or not? Let us stay young, let's dance forever We don't have the power and we never say never Sitting in the sun trip, life is a short trip, the music for the madman. Can you imagine when the face is warm? Turning all the faces into the sun. Praising all leaders, we get in into the music place for the, the madman forever young. I wanna be forever young Do you really want to live forever? Forever, forever young So like the water, so like the heat Some are like melodies, some like the beat Sooner or later, they all just begun why don't you stay young? It's so hard to get all without a cause I don't want to perish like a fading horse Used like diamonds in the sun And diamonds are forever Forever young I want to be forever young do you really want to live forever, forever and ever, forever young? I want to be forever young. Do you really want to live forever, forever, forever?
second feet.